Welcome to John Gets Games. This is my new games radar vlog for June of 2023, and in it, I'm going to talk about 24 games that I've learned about over the last month or so. I'll be going through those in alphabetical order, and I do want to mention that if you prefer to listen to this in podcast form, you can gain access to that as an exclusive perk of backing the Patreon campaign for this channel. You can learn more about that by going to patreon.com slash John Gets Games, and there you can gain access to other exclusives, like watching my dozens of opinions episodes, where I keep talking about the things I like and don't like about the new games that I'm playing, as well as the games that I have played in the past and my evolving opinions of them. You can also gain access to some of my videos early and advertisement free, and of course, get access to that exclusive podcast feed. Now, I think let's come back to these games, and specifically, let's jump into Board Game Geek. I'm going to be looking at the Board Game Geek page for each one of these as we go, and the very first one is Beer Ponieri, uh, which I think is probably actually going to be called Beer Pioneers in an English printing, if there is an English printing. Uh, now, it says, we develop and improve our small home brewery into a large brewery. And I like beer, but the main reason that this jumped out to me, or the first reason anyway, is the designer is Thomas Spitzer. Uh, they designed Hospital Connect, which I really like. Uh, they also designed the Ruhr and uh, Ruhr Schaffart, which was like the original version of that one. I played a demo of that and I liked it. I've owned it for a couple of years. I really should get that played. Uh, but they've designed some really interesting games. And in particular, I really liked Haspel Connect. And it seems like uh, Thomas Spitzer's games are very Euro-y. <laughs> uh, some people would probably call them dry, but they're also very focused on their theme. Uh, like, obviously, there's abstraction in games, but uh, much like the other ones, it seems like this one is really leaning into beer production. Uh, so when we look at some of the images they have online, first of all, this is a two-player only game, which is interesting. I'm definitely enjoying those more as time goes on, even though I, I still don't play them all that often. But Looking at um, this image, uh, we can see there looks to be a player board, a large board in the middle of the table, uh, lots of different icons and spots to put potentially workers. Uh, there are cards which appear to have different little windows and stuff on them. Let's see. If we take a closer look at the cards, uh, perhaps they are multi-use. Actually, I skipped right over the description. Uh, it says, the history of beer brewing dates back to ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia. And over the centuries, various cultures and regions have developed their own unique beers, and especially Germany is considered a beer country. In the game Beer Pioneers, uh, set at the beginning of industrialization around 1850, oh, two to four players. It says two players up at the top. So, Anyway, two to four players <laughs> develop their own small home brewery into a large-scale brewery as brewmasters. In each turn, they take an action by deploying one of their workers or their truck to brew an increasing variety of beers, improving the brewing process with new advancements like refrigeration and beer filters, or increasing the efficiency of their workers, to name a few actions. Action cards also play an important role, and with beer deliveries and other actions, they can earn victory points. Actions take place on the game board and their own tableau, and player order is important and influenced by the players. Uh, so so we over here have uh, worker placement, trading, race, and drawing. Not really sure exactly what they mean by drawing, but um, it definitely feels like it's going to be a worker placement game based off of, uh, well, this image of the board that looks like a bunch of worker placement spots. So <laughs> it's either a two to four player game or a two player game. But either way, I like beer. I've liked at least one game that the designer has made in the past. So I'm quite curious to learn more about this one. All right, next up we have Big Shot, which is not new. <laughs> it came out in 2001, but I only just learned about it, well, within this last month or so. It says, bid for the most valuable properties without falling too deep in debt. Uh, the designer is Alex Randolph, which sounds familiar. Uh, oh, they've designed a lot of classic games. Interesting. Okay, well, anyway, uh, down here it says, this is an auction game in which a set of colored cubes is put up for auction each round based on a random die roll. Whoever wins the bid places those cubes into areas on the game board, and once an area has seven cubes, in it, it is locked and no more cubes can be added. Whoever has the majority of cubes in that area owns it, except that ties for majority are disregarded. So in a spread of 3-3-1, three, three, the player who has one cube is going to win. Now, this uh, is a pretty interesting looking game, even though I'm not crazy about auctions. Uh, this is an old game, obviously, so there's a lot of images of what it looks like uh, online. And essentially, you shuffle up these little cube piles, and everyone has their own cube colors. And then you auction off each of these bundles doing a standard auction. You know, I bid two, you bid three, I pass, I can't go back in. We keep going until somebody pays the most money. Um, they pay that money to the bank and then they take all of those cubes and they put them down however they want. So you will probably frequently, well, pretty much every time you win an auction, you're going to be putting down cubes of somebody else's color. And there are no bad places on the board except for the fact that um, if there's a tie, like I said, then that tie cancels out. So somebody could be winning and you could put a tying cube there and now suddenly you are winning and 
and especially if you put the seventh cube there, that could be enormous, like switching the uh, victory points over. Um, also on the board, there are two X zones. Let's see if I can find an image of the board here. Yeah, this is one version. Uh, and the 2x isn't worth anything, but it multiplies a, an adjacent spot by 2 if you uh, control both of them. And uh, the only other real thing to the game is that there are um, uh, loans. I, I don't think you actually make any money in this game. And you only start with 10 money, so you're going to run out of that quickly. And every time you take a loan, you take less and less money for it, but then you have to pay the loans back for 10 money each at the very end of the game. And I think, you know, the points on the board are money. And that's essentially it. Now, again, I'm not crazy about auctions, but this seems like a fascinating game. You know, winning auctions to place other people's cubes down almost like sort of shared incentive, although you're not sharing incentives so much as, um, <laughs> I guess, sharing the blame <laughs> for uh, messing up various things. It seems like it could be probably very mean, but it also says it's a 30-minute game, and I think I'm okay with playing a, th a mean 30-minute game. Uh, this is probably not going to be my favorite game ever, but I would definitely give it a shot if I had the opportunity. Next up, we have Challengers 2. Uh, I don't have much to say about this one. In fact, I talked about Challengers 1, I guess, uh, in the last Radar Vlog. Uh, it's mostly here just to say that there's a second version coming out. Um, this is uh, very similar to the first one, but it is a standalone expansion. Yeah, it says that right down here. Uh, it can be mixed up with Challengers, the first game, to create new sets and combinations. So it's essentially an expansion that could just be purchased on its own. Um, it says there are new members that you can add to your deck. Um, just, you know, new variety. It seems like it's going to be completely unique things, but everything that you need to actually play the game. I still haven't actually played it yet, but I I'm curious too, and I figure some people might enjoy Challengers 1 and be curious to check out the second one, or maybe you've just heard about both of them and you're like, well, maybe I'll just check out the second one instead of the first one. Uh, I have no idea if one's going to be better than the other, but uh, I just wanted to quickly mention that there is this uh, second version coming out. Next up, we have Clash of the Corgis, a 2023 card game. It says, be the first player to get rid of all their cards in their hand and field, which is very generic way of saying this is a card shedding game. And this first jumped out to me because of, well, there's one image online and it is an image of these corgis and they are so cute. <laughs> <laughs> like little magical corgis uh, sitting on these cards. But anyway, um, down below it says this is a strategic card shedding game for two to four players. And I, I'm not going to read the entire description. It's not very long. But the main reason that this is sticking out to me, in addition to the cute corgi artwork, is that it's a simplistic climbing shedding game. But each of the different uh, corgi types has their own special effect that triggers when they are played. It says the special effects on the cards add a new layer of strategy to the game. And I can definitely imagine that if you're just like, oh, well, I'm going to beat that two with, you know, a four or something like that. If you put the four down and then that also does something else because that happens to be a red four or a green four, that sounds kind of neat. Um, there's no indication of what these special effects might actually be, but I'm curious. It says it's a five to ten minute game, which is very fast. Uh, honestly, probably way faster than I generally like in um, games, even card games. But I'm, I'm mostly keeping my eye on this one because I'm curious to see what these special powers are like. Uh, next up, we have another card game. This is Enemy Anemone. Uh, enemy Anemone? Woo! <laughs> uh, that one uh, says it's a must-not-follow trick-taking with a fishy theme. Uh, this is designed by a friend of mine, Daniel Newman. And in fact, I playtested this one uh, many times. I played the, the final version of it once online. And um, it's actually going up for pre-order right now. Uh, there's a pre-order link that you can go to the Board Game Geek page or the uh, New Mill Industries uh, Twitter feed. You can also find the pre-order link for there. It's very cheap. Um, $21 shipped. Anyway, this is a interesting game because it's very simple to teach, uh, not many rules at all, but it has a must-not-follow thing going on, and it also has gorgeous artwork. This is the pre-order page, and uh, yeah, the artwork, I just really like the way it looks. Uh, but anyway, um, the main uh, crux of the game is, again, uh, it's a trick-taking game. You put cards down, they can't match the color of the other cards. But if you have no cards in your hand that don't match other cards, you actually get to score them for yourself. Uh, you put them kind of face down into a score pile. And at the end of each round, you're going to score points for the number of cards that you have taken in your tricks. So it's not the number of tricks, but the number of cards in those tricks. So whenever you're able to short suit yourself and score for yourself, you're also denying that point or maybe points, plural, uh, from your opponents because some cards are worth uh, two points and some cards are worth one. And also in every single trick, um, the person who plays the highest card is going to win it. But the person who plays the lowest card gets a plus one token. And in the future, they can add that plus one token to a card they play, increasing the value by one. So you have two things that you're vying for. You're trying to win tricks that make sense and you're trying to duck under and get those plus one tokens so that in the future, you can win tricks that really make sense. Perhaps there's multiple cards that are uh, worth two points instead of one. Um, you play four hands, so then the person who has the most 
bonus points is the winner. And that's most of the, the rules to the game right there. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm biased. Daniel is a friend of mine, and I playtested this one many times. Uh, but I like how it ended up, and I put a pre-order in for it already. Okay, next up we have Forest Shuffle. Uh, this one says you build your very own forest in this clever card game for strategists. Uh, now, I'm mostly talking about this one because of a particular image <laughs> that I saw on the Board Game Geek page. Uh, in particular, it looks like it has very interesting uh, cards. Uh, like the cards are kind of split into into multiple halves and whatnot, um, and you're going to be tucking. There's different trees. They're kind of wide cards overall. It looks like there's tucking, there's splaying, there's tableau building perhaps. But anyway, let's go back to the description. Uh, it says that in this game, players are competing to gather the most valuable trees and then attract species to these trees, thus creating an ecologically balanced habitat for flora and fauna. Uh, to start, you're going to have six cards in hand, and the cards depict a, either a particular type of tree or two forest dwellers. And from the latter cards uh, being divided in half, like we saw in that image before, uh, whether vertically or horizontally, with one forest dweller on each half. And then on your turn, you're drawing two cards, um, and then you're going to be putting these cards down into your tableau. I don't need to go through this uh, somewhat significant description overall, uh, but that's essentially enough for me to be intrigued. Uh, it's a 40 to 60 minute game for two to five players. And yeah, I, I just like the look of the cards. I like the idea of uh, building out this uh, uh, tucked uh, tableau with various forests. Uh, it looks like it's probably very Euro-y, getting, you know, points for this and points for that, um, with restrictions, you know, on how you could put things around various other things. I don't know. It looks cute. It's being um, published by Lookout Games, and their games tend to be uh, solid, for sure. Uh, the designer is Kosh, and the only other design they have on BGG is Fife, which was a game about surfboards, I think? Uh, and on the beach, yeah, I never actually played this one, but either way, uh, I think that Force Shuffle could be fun. Uh, next up, we have FTW, question mark, exclamation point. Uh, and um, I learned about this one a few weeks ago, and I immediately subscribed to it because it's uh, designed by Friedman Fries, and he designs pretty interesting games. And this is a, a card game, a shedding game, with cards with numbers. And I, that just instantly grabs my attention overall. Uh, it's simplistic, but I, I like the idea of it. Uh, now, here's the thing. I've actually played this game twice now, and I've decided that it's not really for me, and because of that, I almost didn't put it on this list, but I think it will be for some other people, so I figured I would still mention it because I don't think the game is bad. It's just not really what I'm particularly looking for. Um, they, they don't actually have the rules online, but um, I know somebody who was taught the game at a convention, and we got to play it online. Um, so essentially, the, the crux of this game is you're trying to um, get rid of your hand of cards. Uh, the cards uh, are all unique, like 1 to 40, 1 to 60, depending on the player count, and um, you're putting down these cards, one card at a time. So it's a shedding game where you only play single cards. And um, you need to play a higher card than the last card that was played. Um, if you don't do that, uh, instead you can bank a card off to the side and reserve it, and then take a card that somebody else has played already back into your hand. So you're not really shedding in that case, but maybe you take a really good card so that that's higher value so you can put it down later on uh, and not have to, you know, keep drawing cards back into your hand because you don't want cards in your hand. Also, those banked cards, you can add those to a card when you play it so that you essentially add those together in order to get over the previously played card, but then you discard the banked one so things don't escalate too much. Um, every time somebody banks a card, that kind of wipes the round and somebody plays a new card. And you keep going until uh, just one card is remaining in somebody's hand. That ends the round, and then you score positive points for your highest card and negative points for every other card you have in your hand. And you score points equal to the value of the cards. So if you end with a 48 and then a 47, you get plus 48 and minus 47. And then you might have like a 16 and that's another minus 16 and you might have an eight and that's another minus eight and that's bad. <laughs> so the scores can be all over the place. I played this one twice. Uh, it's very light. Uh, I'm not sure how much strategy there is overall. It definitely seems like just a chuck cards around kind of game. Um, I didn't hate it overall, but I was hoping to maybe find a little bit more there. But the rules are very simple and the, the core idea is pretty neat uh, where you decide when you want to bring cards back and when you want to play the cards, it just seemed to me like the game was maybe playing itself a little bit more than I expected. Anyway, I don't want to be too down on it because other people that I played this with um, have enjoyed it. Uh, you just have to go into it knowing that it's like not a strategic card shedding game by any means. It's a game where you have decisions to make, but uh, frequently the game kind of makes those decisions for you. Uh, after that, we have Galactic Cruise. So this is coming out in 2024, and it says, Build and launch shuttles to send guests on luxurious space vacations. Uh, this one first jumped out to me because the artist is Ian O'Toole, and they have an image of the box cover, and 
it just looks gorgeous. I, I really like Iona Tool's uh, art style, and this is a very retro futurism, which I also uh, very much enjoy. Uh, there's some images of what the prototype looks like online. It looks like looks like we have some dual layer boards and whatnot. But anyway, the second reason that this really caught my attention had to do with the description. So um, it says everybody's essentially working for the same company, uh, this Galactic Cruise, but it is a uh, competitive game overall. It says we are a united company, and you'll often find that what other supervisor does will make your job easier, aka shared incentives, maybe. Uh, and But it says, let me be clear, though, this is a competition. The supervisor who comes out on top will become the CEO of the company. Um, so uh, there's a ton of mechanisms listed for this game. Uh, it looks like we have hand management, income, market, modular boards, open drafting, set collection, track movement. I think they might have over tagged this game <laughs> with various mechanisms. But um, I'm mostly keeping my eye on this because it, it seems like it could be kind of shared incentive -y. It's not like one Galactic Cruise versus another one. No, everyone's working for the same company, trying to make the company do well, while also trying to make sure they come out on top. Um, I like the potential art style. Uh, it does say it's a 90 to 150 minute game, so probably verging on, you know, the heavy side of medium or maybe even just a heavy game overall. Uh, so I'm curious to see how complex it is. But um, either way, this is what I'm definitely keeping an eye on. Uh, maybe it isn't actually shared incentives and I'm reading too much into that, but I'm looking forward to learning more about this one. Next up, we have Great Kingdom. Uh, it says, create the biggest kingdom by strategically placing castles. Now, this is uh, actually the first of three games I'm going to be talking about in this uh, radar vlog uh, from the same designer, Lee Sedol, uh, and also being published by Korea Board Games. And that's because these three games are essentially being uh, marketed as not really a package, but more of like a, a series. Uh, so down here, it says, building a kingdom is no easy task, more so if your enemy is trying to occupy the same territory. Build the biggest kingdom by strategically placing your own castles and destroying the enemies. A single enemy castle is enough to win the game. Great Kingdom simplifies Go without taking the fun away for experienced players, making it the perfect gateway into the world of Go. It is the first of three games of the game series Wisestone, uh, developed by Go Grandmaster Lee Sedol. So uh, there's actually Actually, a video um, in Korean that had some uh, subtitles that I was able to watch to get some idea of how the game played. And so, yeah, this is one of three games designed by this uh, Go Grandmaster trying to, I guess, make Go more accessible. So it's a two-player only game. Uh, you are putting these little castle pieces down onto a 9x9 nine nine grid, and it seems um, Go-ish in a lot of ways, like you're trying to um, enclose terrain and you know score terrain, but the game also ends immediately if you ever fully surround, like on every single side, any opponent's piece. You capture that piece, removing it, and then the game is over. So uh, that's one thing that can happen numerous times, I think, in Go. I've played Go a couple times, but I am very bad at it. Uh, but yeah, this seems to be just a slight simplification that also brings in a wrinkle of you have this uh, neutral castle in the middle that kind of creates extra walls, so to speak, that can uh, create some interesting uh, wrinkles. I'm not in love with this kind of game in general, but I think this sounds fascinating. Um, I, I've been curious to learn a little bit more about Go, and this is definitely a version that I would not mind giving a try a few times to see if um, if I enjoy it. Like, it seems like it's probably ridiculously easy to teach and, uh, you know, quick to play again and again versus um, Go games can, can go quite a while, I think. Uh, and you could realize that you're losing and then lose for a really long time, whereas it seems like in this one, if you're losing badly, it's, it's probably just about to be over. Next up, we have King's Crown, which is the second game in this uh, uh, selection uh, from the designer Lee Sedell and published by Korea Board Games. Uh, now, I know a little bit less about this one, but it says combining Go's open gameplay with the chance taking of bingo. This game does not only require strategic thinking, but also a good memory. It is divided into two phases, stone acquisition and stone playing. Your goal is to get a bingo by playing your chosen stones. Choose what information you give your opponent and try to remember what you know about their game plan. Uh, there are a couple images, and the pieces are little crowns with numbers on them. It looks like it's a 5x5 five five board, and players do have shields. So it looks like some of the information, yeah, is going to be hidden behind these shields. I'm not sure exactly what they mean by bingo. Uh, I mean, probably, you know, getting things in a straight line overall, but I'm not sure if there's another le level to that or not. Uh, but yeah, this is another two-player only abstract. This one says 20 to 60 minutes, though. So the last one said 20 minutes. So it appears this one might be uh, a little bit, uh, I don't know if more complex is the word, but uh, longer strategically than the other one was. Uh, maybe has a couple more things going on. Um, either way, this one also looks kind of fascinating. 
All right, next up we have Craftwagon Age of Engineering. This re-implements Craftwagon, which came out in 2015. Uh, I played that one a couple of times, and the designer is Matthias Kramer. Uh, and the same thing can be said about um, this new version, although the publisher is Samurak Games, and there is just about nothing about them on BGG. Anyway, down here it says that um, in this game, uh, it's a re-implementation of the original design with improvements and simplifications that lessen the luck factor. Uh, now, I, again, I only played Craftwagon the original, version twice and um, the second time I played it with a variant uh, I can't remember the details of it but there were certain cards in this engineering deck that just seemed drastically worse than others so I actually took those bad cards out so that the overall consistency of the power level of those engineering cards was uh, more even uh, maybe I wasn't the only one who had this uh, issue and maybe that's what they're talking about with the luck factor here or maybe it's something else uh, but uh, much like the original game like this is a re-implementation um, I'm sure it has the uh, kind of Glenn Moore-esque uh, rondelle system. I'm looking at the uh, the original version of the game. Uh, there is this action rondelle where essentially the person who's farthest back gets to take their turn and they can go as far forward as they want and they take that action and then they push that action to the very end of the line and then they might have to wait a little bit as somebody else does a bunch of actions. So in Glenn Moore, um, this system is for taking tiles and putting them into your tableau. For uh, Craft Dragon, it's just about actions. You don't actually remove these tokens. You just punt them to the end of the line and the ones that people like more are going to be pushed off later on, and the ones that people keep skipping, you might be able to do a few of those in a row um, as people potentially skip over those. Uh, you're building up cars with various attributes and trying to get around this test track and just get points for a variety of things. And I'm quite curious to learn about uh, this re-implementation. It does not have a date right now, uh, and again, the publisher doesn't appear to have published anything in the past, or at least not on BGG, so who knows when this will actually happen, but I'm keeping my eye out because I do remember enjoying it, and I like the systems. It just didn't turn into a game the original version, anyway, didn't turn into a game that I loved. Uh, maybe this new version will be that game. Next up, we have Lata. It says, manage carefully your actions, auction for the best fish, and deliver uh, to the best markets. Uh, the designers are Costa and Rola, and it's published by Pythagoras. Um, now, they... Uh, have designed many things, <laughs> and this uh, publisher has put out many things as well. But I'm going to skip to the very bottom of the description right uh, at the beginning and say this is the second game in the Quinnus collection following the success of Cafe, the first game in the line. So Cafe was a lovely little game. Um, yeah, I made a tutorial for that game. Uh, you could search Junkets Games Cafe, and I'm sure you could find it. Uh, but it was all about uh, building out a tableau of cards that you kind of stacked on top of each other, trying to make coffee, <laughs> essentially, and get points for that. Uh, this game appears to be quite different, uh, and the rulebook is online, and I, I took a, a, a sizable glance at it to have some idea of how it works. Now, let's go back to the description here. It says, Lata means tin can in English, and it's the name of the raw material for the containers in which the fish is packed, and it's also turned out to be a popular uh, designation for the product. Uh, in this game, players manage local canning companies in the 1950s and produce and sell famous canned sardines or canned macaroni the two main canned fish uh, of the first decades of the industry before the appearance of the very popular tuna. Uh, the game takes place over six rounds, and in each round, players buy a catch of fish, tomato, or olive oil, which they can then use in their factory. These preserves will then be sold in the markets. This operation will result in money that can be used to buy scorecards and increase the factory's production. Now, here's the ca uh, catch, the, the interesting twist, at least as far as I can tell. Uh, the order in which each batch of raw materials is chosen is given by an auction of action points that the players secretly bid by um, doing a sliding scale behind their board. So essentially, there are nine actions that you could take on each turn. But before you do any actions, you bid a certain number of actions that you will lose. So you might bid three actions, and then we all remove our shields, and the person who bid the most actions gets to go first, but they have less actions available. Uh, let's say I bid three actions, but you bid five. Well, you get to go before me and get the better stuff, but you only have four actions left, nine minus five. Whereas by the time it comes around to me, I have six actions because I only bid three of those. And somebody else might have bid zero actions, and by the time it comes around to them, probably going last, they have nine actions to do, but they might not have nine good actions to do. I, I don't know, again, all the specifics. I didn't read the rules super carefully. I just wanted to learn more about this specific auction system. And, you know, I'm not in love with auctions. I, I do think they can be interesting. And this one in particular is something that I don't feel like I've seen before. Before. I'm not going to say it's brand new. Maybe something else has done it. But uh, that idea of having less to do but being able to do it earlier um, is, I'm sure, 
not the newest thing. I'm, I'm sure there are other games that do it in some way, shape, or form. I just haven't seen it in this specific way. It seems neat. Uh, the game is a one to four player game, 20 to 45 minutes, so not terribly long at all. Um, so again, you go through six rounds and you do these six auctions and then you do these actions. Um, and that's essentially what's going on with this game. I imagine the actions themselves aren't overly complicated if it's a 20 to 45 minute game. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see how that auction system actually plays out uh, when you're playing it. And this is one I would not mind trying. Next up, we have Mycelia again. <laughs> uh, there are a couple of Mycelias that have uh, been put onto Board Game Geek uh, somewhat recently. A uh, completely different game, designer, uh, publisher, and everything. Uh, now, there's not a whole lot about this game online right now, but there are some pretty looking images. Uh, the publisher is Ravensburger. Their games usually look good. The designer is Daniel Grainer, and they have no other designs on BGG, so a first-time designer. Uh, now, it says each player starts with the same set of cards in Mycelia, improving their deck with better cards over the course of the play as they race to clear their playing field of dewdrops first. In this deck building game, you need the support of mysterious forest dwellers to improve your deck, develop new and better skills, and bring the sacred dewdrops from your forest to the Shrine of Light in order to receive the forest goddess's support. The game includes double-sided player boards for increased variability. Uh, that's essentially all there is online, but again, there is a somewhat detailed image of what the game looks like. Uh, there is this raised kind of tree stump, which is maybe a scoreboard or maybe that's the shrine. Uh, and then everyone has their own player board with a bunch of uh, a square grid on it and little dewdrops. Uh, it says it's a deck building game. So I guess you're trying to remove these dewdrops in various ways. There appears to be a market of new cards that you're taking. I'm not sure how standard of a deck building game this is or if there's any other twists that they bring in, but I'm curious to learn more about it. Um, it has a wonderful look to it. I don't mind deck building. It says it's a 45 minute game and one to four players. So not terribly long overall. Uh, yeah, there could be a nice game here. Next up, we have Nine Nights, which is the third of the three games uh, from uh, Korea Board Game Co., designed by Lee Sedol. Uh, now, much like the second one, I don't know all the rules as much, uh, but uh, looking down at the description, it says, In a battle between knights, who can reach their secret goal first? In Nine Nights, players need to reach goal tiles with the matching knight in order to win. The numbers a player puts on a knight do not only represent their goal tile, however, that's also their strength in battle with enemy knights. Choose wisely whom to move and try to figure out the numbers of your enemy knights before they know yours. Uh, and there are some images of what the game looks like. So you have nine knights, <laughs> I'm assuming uh, ranging in number from one to nine, and uh, you put these little tokens behind them. So it's kind of like Stratego, uh, where you can see the numbers on your knights, but your opponent can't, and you're moving them. And on the other side of the board, there are the nine tokens. I'm not sure if they're randomized. It looks like they might be. And I guess you're just trying to move, you know, your four knight over to the four spot on the opposing side. And of course, if these two knights fight, you're going to flip them over and see the various strengths of them. And I, the stronger one will win in that fight. I have no idea what happens in a tie. Um, I don't even know how the specific movement rules work, if it's just once orthogonally or diagonally or maybe multiple in a row. But I guess as you're moving a knight over, your opponent might be thinking, wow, that, that, that knight's getting pretty close to like the four and the six and the one. I wonder if it's a four, a six, and a one or a one. Maybe I'll send my seven over there to try and defeat it. But of course, if you defeat it, then I guess that would show the seven and then your opponent knows. It seems like kind of an interesting twist on a Stratego type gameplay on a relatively small board. It says it's a 10 to 20 minute game, so rather quick overall. And I think this could have some pretty neat uh, twists to it overall. All right, next up we have Orbit Master. Restore the celestial orbit of the Zodiac by choosing the Master Sign. Uh, it's a three to six player game uh, designed by Jason Gamer, and this is their only design on BGG, self-published, so you probably can't get it right now. But anyway, I, I just wanted to talk about this one a little bit because I like the idea of the theme. Uh, it says that Orbit Master is a trick-taking strategy card game that's based on the Zodiac. Uh, in a turn-by-turn -turn gameplay, players choose one sign to play, and the first player to build a house of the other 11 signs under the master sign wins the game, but beware, the 13th sign can poison your master sign and change the course of the game. Um, there is a bit more to the description, but not a whole lot more as far as how the actual trick-taking works and scoring works, but it appears to be a trick-taking game where you have set collection in mind, where you're trying to get one of each of the uh, 12 zodiac signs without getting that 13th zodiac sign to kind of mess everything up. Um, I have no idea if this is actually going to be an interesting game overall. Uh, right now, there is just an image of the cover of the game, and it looks nice, uh, but I'm intrigued enough to follow this one. It says 60 to 90 minutes, so that's on the longer side for modern trick takers, and I'm certainly 
not uh, opposed to a longer trick taker. I, I like 60 to 90 minute games a lot. Um, and with so many trick taking games being like 20 to 30 minutes, um, that would that might honestly feel a little bit refreshing playing a, a longer form version of it. So hopefully there'll be some more information about this one on BGG soon. All right, we now have an older game. It's Recurring, uh, coming out in 2016. Uh, now, I first heard about this one, honestly, about a year ago. Uh, I just didn't make it to my radar list because it didn't really percolate up too much to make it onto the list. But then uh, a few weeks ago, a friend of mine whose opinion I trust played this one at Board Game Geek Spring and fell in love with it. Absolutely loves it and was raving about it, so I looked into it more, and now... He's got me pretty curious. Uh, so the reason I first heard about this is because I started playing Hachi Train a whole bunch last year. I've talked about it several times, many times on uh, uh, John Gets Games, especially a lot in my exclusive opinions episodes. Hachi Train got a lot of discussion there uh, because I like it a lot. And that's a card shedding game where the main quirk is when you beat somebody else's cards because you're trying to get rid of your cards, you have to take their cards and put them back into your hand. And I remember one of the times I played Hachi Train early on, I was teaching it and playing it. And one person around the table was like, oh, this reminds me of recurring. And I was like, oh, okay, that's cool. But it seemed like a lot of people didn't have the fondest things to say about recurring. A lot of people seem to be turned off by it. But then another friend of mine loves it. So I'm on the I want to try it train for this game now. Uh, train. <laughs> so I'm not going to go into all the rules of it, but it seems like it is very similar to Hachi Train. But uh, one of the main quirks is that the deck makeup is asymmetric uh, with the numbers. It goes one to nine, and then there's a bunch of these R cards, which are low value. But there's only one one in the deck. Two twos, three threes, etc., all the way up to nine nines, as opposed to games like Hachi Train and the newer Nana Tori Dori, which is essentially Hachi Train 2, um, where there's uh, the same amount of each of the numbers, like, you know, uh, nine ones, nine twos, nine threes. So this one has a similar gameplay mechanism where if somebody plays a single, you could beat it with a pair, but obviously, if you have lower numbers, there's less of those in the deck, but lower numbers are stronger. So you could beat a three with a two, but um, if you want to beat a three with a pair, you're more likely to put down a couple of nines because there's nine nines in the deck and there's only two twos. Uh, so that just sounds interesting. Also, Hachi Train has it where one person loses and everybody else wins, which I'm totally fine with, but in recurring, only one person wins. So... I'm curious. This game came out in 2016, uh, so what, seven or so years ago? Uh, six years before Hachi Train, which is a game I really fell in love with. And I've got to try this and see if maybe this is a game I actually like more than Hachi Train, or maybe Hachi Train improved on it. I, I won't know until I try it, but uh, I'm definitely hoping to make that happen very soon. Next up, we have Spellbook. Uh, it's a 2023 release. We're halfway through the year, so probably coming out soon. Uh, it is coming from Space Cowboys, who make great games, and the designer is Phil Walker Harding, which is the main reason I'm talking about it. Um, I like Phil Walker Harding's games in general. Almost all of them that I've played, I've really enjoyed, uh, usually for their simplicity of rule sets and complexity of decision space. Not that they're crazy complex, but they're so simple in their rules, and the complexity is there. Uh, games like Baron Park, for example, I, I really like that one. Uh, so anyway, this game also seems pretty interesting. Uh, down below, it says, in Spellbook, each player, uh, accompanied by a familiar, possesses a grimoire and collects materia to master spells and feed their familiar. The game provides pre-drawn spell sets for use in the early rounds, but soon, players start drawing spells randomly or create their own spell combinations that are common to all players. Uh, it says, each spell combination gives an effect that lasts the rest of the game, and the more ingenious the combination, the more powerful the effect. As the rounds progress, uh, the game becomes uh, different because obviously you get these new and new spell effects and it says there are more than 2,100 spell combinations being possible. The game ends as soon as the magician's grimoire is complete or familiar is fully fed and then the player with the most points wins. Um, there's a couple images of the game. They're not super detailed, uh, but it looks like there are various card tableaus and I'm not sure exactly how these spells are crafted uh, based off the image, but I love that idea of crafting spell combos of which there are 2,100 combinations but then having them apply to everybody. So you're, I guess, going to try to make spell combinations that happen to be better for you, even though other people can use it. Um, that has a width of shared incentives. I'm not really sure, but um, this seems interesting. Uh, I, I'm honestly interested in playing just about anything that Phil Walker Carding comes out with because, again, they're super quick to teach and they're generally quite interesting and they're generally not too long. This one says 45 minutes and I really like the sound of everything that this game is talking about. 
Next up, we have Steam Power. Cleverly build your rail network and reap the rewards. Uh, now, the designer of this one is Martin Wallace, and I actually first learned about this one because I'm going to be doing a sponsored tutorial video for this one. Uh, I made a sponsored video for Bloodstones um, that uh, Martin Wallace also designed. Uh, that video came out somewhat recently. I can't remember if that was this year or last year. But anyway, this is a new train game. Uh, it is, uh, as far as I can tell, uh, based off what I know, and I'm not sure how much I can actually say, uh, because I have seen the rules, but it might be somewhat embargoed. But um, this is a game where players are going to race to build the best rail network to meet uh, contractual obligations to make the most money. On your turn, you perform two actions from a selection of choices, letting you lay tracks, build factories, fulfill contracts, earn money, or collect more contracts. Building a factory brings resources to the board that all players have access to at a price, Gameplay is fast, engagement is positive, and rules are simple, making this a great game, uh, time to pull out uh, if you have limited time or newer gamers around the table. So uh, I will say that when you're putting track down, the track is yours. It's not communal track. But then as it says, you're also going to put factories down that are yours that other people can use in order to fulfill those contracts. And you can use other people's tracks as well. And if you use other people's tracks and factories, you literally have to pay them money to do that. But then you might still want to do that to get those cubes to then complete your contracts to give yourself uh, points as well. Uh, it seems like it's relatively simple, actually quite simple from a rules perspective. I haven't actually played it. I've just taken a glance at the rules. It says it's two to five players, 45 to 90 minutes. I know that, again, you have your own trains. You can block each other, but you can overbuild your own track if you get blocked to kind of change your direction. It seems neat. It definitely seems like the kind of game that I would enjoy playing in general. And I'm pretty excited to do a sponsored tutorial video for this one uh, when the time comes for it. Next up, we have Tangram City. Uh, the designer is Uwe Rosenberg, which is certainly the first reason I'm talking about this, but also it's published by Korea Board Games. This is the fourth game I'm talking about in this radar vlog uh, being published by them. I... I'm just really liking the look of their games overall. Anyway, it says in this game, which is one to five players, 10 to 40 minutes. So could be a very quick game. Probably the 10 is one player and the 40 minutes is five. It says you puzzle a harmonious city worthy of the queen to collect the most points. Uh, down below, uh, specifically, it says you're trying to make a uh, city that is balanced between your red buildings and your green park tiles. And you also want to bring in rectangular shapes because those are important for fortification. Uh, it says players are going to place tiles in a randomly determined order in a square field while trying to balance the amount of those different symbols. Uh, the more balanced you are, the more points you get. Now, there are some images of what the game looks like online, and one of them is very high definition. We can zoom in a lot, probably way too much here. But as you can see, players have their own board. They're putting these tangram pieces down, which have, you know, diagonals in the middle of them. And it appears that uh, players are going to be, uh, there's going to be a card drawn and placed up at the top. And I think that's going to tell everybody, you know, place this tile down, place that tile down in a, ran in a random order. I'm not exactly positive about that. But then looking at the top of the player board, we can see the balance. Um, if you are perfectly balanced with your red and your green, you get 20 points. If you are off balance by one or two, you get 10, three to four is five. And if you have five or more out of balance, you get zero points for that. But then you also get, it looks like 15 points for every rectangle that you're able to build in your city. This it looks like a simplistic game overall for sure, but I love polyomino games and I haven't actually played a Tangram style polyomino game before. Uh, so I'm intrigued. I mean, this seems quite light overall, very quick to play. I, I highly doubt this is going to be a game that I fall in love with or anything, but it's certainly a game I would like to try because it seems like it leans in directions that I enjoy and uh, it's relative short uh, uh, playtime is maybe a problem. For me personally, but also maybe it's a boon because you could just, you know, weave it in with other things. Uh, yeah, I definitely want to give this one a go if I have the chance. Moving on, we have Thistleden. Uh, this is a 2025 release, so... Not exactly soon. It says forest animal folk evolve from humble beginnings in the village of Thistleden. Now, this first jumped out to me because of the designer, Ben Eisner. Um, they are part of the design team on Wonderland's War, Tidal Blades, Tidal Blades 2, uh, The Grim Masquerade, just a whole bunch of games. In particular, <laughs> Tidal Blades 2 sticks out because uh, when we look down at the description, it says each player has a 3x3 three three card tableau representing their den. During the planning phase, each player chooses a denizen card in secret to add to their den, then all cards are revealed and players place their denizen cards in their grid and activate all the cards in that row or column, each of which grants actions based on its type. Uh, at the end of the round, if a row is full, the player discards two of the cards in that active row, keeping 
the one they just played, and discarded cards are placed into their legacy tableau, adding strength to future actions as their civilization grows in age and knowledge. Now, this is very similar to the uh, activation grid, uh, the Nexus grid in Tidal Blades 2, which is very present on my mind because I have done dozens of hours <laughs> helping them out with the rule book for that one, the campaign book, editing. I've done a lot of work for Tidal Blades 2. Um, and yeah, this is one of the designers of that game. It looks like they're making a a Euro game. It doesn't say how long it is. I, I wouldn't surprise me if this is like a 45 to 60 minute game, but it looks like they're making more of just a, a Euro game using that uh, three by three grid idea, which seems really smart in Tidal Blades 2. And I feel like it's going to be really smart here as well. I love that spatial idea of combo building. I like the idea of, you know, using cards multiple times until boom, they're gone, but now they give you a permanent uh, effect. Um, I just think there's a lot here that I could really like. Uh, Tidal Blades 2, I don't want to talk about too much, but it has a lot of very cool mechanical ideas, but it's a game I'll probably never play because I just don't have the space in my life for campaign style games that much anymore. And I don't really have interest in my group for uh, that kind of uh, dungeon crawl type of experience. But I've loved the idea of this uh, Nexus grid since I first um, heard about uh, uh, Tidal Blades 2. So seeing a side game that leans in to that mini game that I'm most interested about that other game that I probably just won't have an opportunity to weave into my gaming life makes me excited. Unfortunately, I'll probably have to wait a while. 2025 is, uh, is a ways off. Next up, we have Ticket to Ride Legacy Legends of the West. Uh, so speaking of campaigns, uh, it says build train lines across the United States in a 12 game campaign. Uh, now, this is designed by Alan Moon, who was the original designer of Ticket to Ride, but then also Matt Leacock and Rob Davio, who famously worked together making the Pandemic Legacy campaigns with uh, uh, Season 1, Season 2, and Season 0. Uh, and Rob Davio has um, even more uh, cred with Legacy, uh, essentially getting it started off with Risk Legacy and whatnot. Um, so this is Ticket to Ride Legacy. Like, literally, that's the name of the game, and it seems like it is very much going to be in the vein of uh, Pandemic Legacy. And I loved Pandemic Legacy Season 1 and Season 2. Wasn't too crazy about Season 0. We never actually finished that one, but we really liked Season 1 and 2. And I also liked Risk Legacy. I played that one way back when it first came out. I was in a group who played it over and over again. I think I played like six or so times in that campaign. I didn't see it all the way to the end. But the main difference there is that Risk Legacy was a competitive game and Pandemic is a fully cooperative game. So here we have another Legacy game that's competitive, essentially leaning back into the Risk Legacy aspects after uh, uh, Rob Davio has a lot more experience designing Legacy games and has worked very, very well with Matt Leacock designing those Pandemic Legacies. So bringing all of that um, experience into Ticket to Ride honestly has me quite curious. I like Ticket to Ride. Uh, it's not my favorite game by any means. It was not a gateway game for me. By the time I played it for the first time, I had I, I was uh, hundreds of games in and, and a couple of years into uh, the board gaming hobby. But I've enjoyed Ticket to Ride every time I've played it. And the idea of having a legacy experience for this one feels very compelling. I, I think it is about the same complexity as the original Pandemic. So I think it's a great starting point for a legacy game. We can see this image um, that the board kind of has puzzle pieces missing and you only have the east uh, coast of the United States at the start of the game. And as it said, you're going to go through 12 games. I believe I read somewhere that each of these games is going to be between like 20 minutes and 60 minutes, maybe ramping up as the game gets more complex, as new rules are added in and, and the map gets bigger. But this seems neat. Uh, it's not cheap. I think the MSRP on it is like $120. So I don't think this is a game I'm going to be rushing out to buy, but it's certainly one I would not mind experiencing, mostly, again, because I loved uh, the, the, the first two Pandemic Legacies. And uh, I played those both with my wife all the way through, and she liked them as well, but she's not a huge fan of cooperative games. Uh, I don't think she's also a huge fan of Ticket to Ride in general, but I'm curious to see what she thinks about you know, a pandemic game made by these people who've given us these amazing gaming experiences, but then having the competitive nature kind of brought into it to spice things up as well. Uh, yeah, uh, this one I think is going to be very exciting for a lot of people. I'm moderately excited for it as well. I'm just not sure if I'm $120 excited, if that makes sense. All right, we now have another card game. Uh, this is TikTok Time, and it came out in 2019, and I don't have much to say about this. Uh, it, uh, I think, had a very tiny print run. Uh, it says it's a card game of clocks and time. The game is played with 48 clock cards in 15-minute intervals and 12 time cards. The player who uses all their cards first wins. It's a shedding game based on clocks. Uh, that's essentially it for the information that's online. And the reason this um, came to my attention is because I'm currently designing a trick-taking game, not a 
shedding game, but a trick-taking game that uses this exact deck, uh, having 12 different uh, suits, essentially, and then each suit has four ranks. And this is that same deck, 48 cards, 48 cards. And uh, a friend of mine who playtested my game said, hey, that game seems familiar. And then they pointed this one out to me. Um, obviously, TikTok Time is a shedding game, not a trick-taking game. They seem like they're very different, but um, I don't know. I, I just felt like mentioning it. it seems like one of those super esoteric games with an interesting premise that uh, just happens to coincide with a premise that I am also working on. Uh, I, I think some of my friends have actually had a chance to play this one in the past. And uh, who knows? Maybe I'll have a chance to uh, give this one a shot. If I see it in the wild, I think I'll definitely give it a try just to see what this designer did with this deck makeup that I'm trying to do other things with. All right, we now have Tipiary. It's a 2023 release. It says, build an Irish country piece by piece. Uh, this one jumped out to me first because the designer is Gunter Burkhardt, and I've really enjoyed some of Gunter Burkhardt's games. Sealand is amazing. Maori is really good. And uh, Ulm, I was a little bit less about, uh, <laughs> but he's got 95 games. Uh, some of them are going to be hit, some are misses, but I love Sealand. And Sealand is enough for me to be intrigued by pretty much anything that Gunter Burkhardt puts out. Um, so this is a tile-laying game where players are challenged to create their perfect vision of an Irish country by placing polygominoes, which is something I love, uh, and thus collecting sheep, uh, castles, and whiskey. Um, it says the linchpin of the game is a magical stone circle that decides which of the tiles you can choose from. After 12 rounds, one player will be named Chief of the Tipiary. There's a whole bunch of images of what this game looks like, and it looks like everybody is going to be building their own polygomino area in front of them. And yeah, there is this magic circle uh, that you're going to be grabbing tiles from. It looks like there's frequently going to be multiple tiles, and it looks like it kind of has a spinner in the middle. Um, I, I don't know too much more about how this game actually plays, but I am super intrigued. Uh, I love polyomino puzzles. I'm just a huge sucker for these kinds of games. Um, I, I do kind of wish there were more communal polyomino puzzles where everybody's building one big polyomino thing in the middle as opposed to building your own. This one has you building your own, and that's fine. Um, maybe there'll be more communal ones that come out in the future. But um, looking at some of the images uh, of this one, looks like maybe at a convention or something. Yeah, you've got multiple tiles that are getting placed out. Uh, there's a bunch of sheep meeples. It just looks very aesthetically pleasing to me. I, I love the look of these kind of things, and I find it very satisfying to put these things together. Um, so matching that with a designer I really like, a playtime that's perfect for me, 45 to 60 minutes, two to five players. Uh, this is a game that I know I want to try at some point. I'm not sure I'm going to fall in love with it, but I definitely want to give it a go. All right, we've reached the final game that I'm talking about today, and that is Tricky War. Uh, the designer is Flavian, and um, they've participated in several of my uh, live Q&A vlogs. Uh, that, that's honestly most of the reason this jumped out to me. I'm like, oh, hey, I think I know Flavian. Uh, and this seems like a potentially interesting game. I, 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 there are uh, playingcards.io versions and tabletop simulator versions of this game, as well as a rulebook that's online that I took a look at. Uh, it seems like it's a pretty simple game using a 52-card deck, as well as some point tokens, some bidding tokens, and a, a trump reminder. But it seems like this is a trick-taking game and also war, like the game war. Uh, if you're not familiar with war, it's like the first card game you learn as a kid, or at least it was for me, where you just shuffle up a deck of cards, deal it out to the players evenly, and you just draw the top card. Who has the high card? They win. Draw the top card. Who has the high card? They win. So war has literally no skill. It is 100% random, which is, I think, why I learned it at such an early age, as I was kind of under, starting to figure out the rules of games as opposed to, like, the decisions and strategy of games. So this is essentially war with bidding, and then the way you actually uh, figure out who wins is trick-taking. So you're going to be bidding uh, how many tricks you think you're going to take, and the person who wins the bid gets to set the trump suit, and then... You all take your hand of cards, you look at your hand, you do the bidding, you set the trump suit, um, then you shuffle that up, and then you play war, just one card at a time. Uh, the highest uh, card, uh, the, uh, the highest trump suit's going to win, if there's no trump, I think it's just the highest card's going to win, something like that. Uh, and so it's fully random when these cards are actually going to come out. It seems a bit bonkers. Uh, obviously, there's going to be just a ton of randomness in this game, but also trying to figure out bidding and then going into it, honestly, it sounds a lot like Challengers, which is uh, a game that uh, I've talked about a couple times in this vlog and more so in the last Radar vlog, where that was a deck building game where you then shuffled up your deck and just played one card at a time and you hoped that your deck was good enough. Um, so this seems like it could be a fun experience. I imagine it's incredibly uh, tactical and random and you're probably groaning at the, the shuffle of the deck and you're cheering when things come together really perfectly. You have some agency here, obviously, because you are 
choosing your bids and you're choosing the Trump and you're looking at your hand trying to figure out what the best thing is. And then you're just going to let it ride and see what actually happens. Uh, who knows? Maybe it's a lot of fun. Maybe it isn't. But I figured it was worth uh, mentioning here on the vlog. So yeah, that is going to wrap this one up. I talked about less games today than I have in the past couple of these. Uh, it just seemed like there were less uh, games that were posted to Board Game Geek over the last month, uh, which I'm totally fine with. <laughs> uh, in previous vlogs, I've had to edit like from like 60 down to like 34 or 30 games. Uh, but today, um, I, I pretty comfortably uh, was able to talk about 24. I cut a couple of them out. Um, I think we are just now approaching convention season, like Origins is happening, I think, literally right now as I'm recording this, or it's just about to start happening. Gen Con is not too far away, so I'm sure there's going to be a, a huge ramp up in more game announcements, and I'm planning on doing another one of these next month, so keep your eyes out for that one. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos just like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, then please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.